I'm Colin Hambrook, editor of Disability Arts Online. I'm an older white man wearing glasses and sitting in my home office with one of Vince Laws' blue plaques behind me. It reads, 1952 to 2012, Her Majesty the Queen never read my blog. Welcome to our artist presentation with Scott J. Hurley. Scott is a writer, director and composer. He's written music for Edinburgh Fringe shows and has produced a presentation for us about the development of a piece of work funded by BBC Arts and created during the pandemic called Stoma, the Musical. He tells a great story of resilience and adapting to what many would regard as an impossible situation, making decisions on cuts and takes with the editor and music supervisor from a hospital bed. He presents a clear challenge to the performing arts industry about what it can learn from the pandemic in ensuring it does not dismiss the talents of disabled artists. Scott is a young white man in his 20s with a head of bleach blonde hair cut close at the sides. He presents to camera in front of a large window with blinds. There are two musical inserts in the presentation in which a black and white still of Scott shows his stomach with the stoma covering in place. So when the pandemic hit, the entire industry I was in was in complete crisis. Uh, shows that had been running for 30 years closed overnight. Um, the show I had just been working on as a technician was shut down mid-run. Um, and the art, small arts organisation that I worked for um, in Gloucester shut its doors. And even now, I don't think, uh, is, is back open full time. And um, everyone was kind of left scrambling for ideas about what to do. And it's funny because I think the pandemic, as we know, in a, in a, has a much larger impact than arts. And so perhaps we were being really selfish, not thinking about um, how uh, the pandemic affected us all, but how it affected our livelihoods and affected our creativity. But nonetheless, that is what we thought, uh, is what we were thinking about. So I think uh, we were scrambling for ideas and that led to some things uh, that were kind of panicked and rushed. It led to a lot of Zoom pieces, but it also led to something for me that was really, really personal. And it was something that kind of, I was on the fringe, I think of, forgetting, but over the course of coronavirus became very, very clear uh, and back in the forefront uh, of my life. And um, I had wanted for a while to do some kind of show that talked about uh, an experience that happened to me uh, towards the end of 2018, at the beginning of 2019, when I was a front of house member of um, the Victoria Palace Theatre where Hamilton plays, uh, and I became sick. And uh, I went from doing eight shows a week to being in a hospital bed within the case of a week. And uh, I became sicker and sicker and it looked like that unless I had a life-changing surgery um, that I probably wasn't going to make it. So I ended up having a surgery that removed a large part of my digestive system and installed a stoma. Now this led to a lot of questions for me about how I could be involved in an industry that is predominantly live, that is based on dependability, and particularly live dependability, can people go out on stage or press buttons or reliably move lights um, without having to dart off to the bathroom or to, um, you know, uh, sort of change an appliance or something like that. And it's, I think, uh, something that a lot of creatives are starting to have discussions more about, not just about stomas, but things like mental health. Uh, things like ME and other kind of disabilities and I found myself thinking about that at the start of the pandemic because suddenly we were all in this position where we couldn't make art and I thought well, what I really wanted to do was use the pandemic, a time when live entertainment was completely impossible, to develop a show that was kind of all about that and I thought the best way of doing it, being a huge fan of musicals, was to do it as a musical and to kind of show, particularly with my disability, the sort of awkwardness 
that it can sort of bring to the forefront in its kind of um, in its full gloriousness and kind of have a um, and kind of have a show that was a musical, but it couldn't be live. And there was no question about that. And I didn't really want to write something and then wait for this whole thing to blow over. I, I, it was a story I wanted to tell now because I think in that moment, every creative was forced to think about how they were stopped from making their art. And in three years time, that will, won't be the case and it will be forgotten. Um, you know, us with people with disabilities will live a daily sort of life of how difficult it is, but all the artistic directors and all the busy producers and those kind of people, they will have forgotten in three years. So a, a sense of urgency was really important to me. And the funny old thing um, was that just before the pandemic had hit, about five months before, I had actually had my stoma removed, tucked back inside uh, my body. So I had less of this, uh, so I had less of the sort of overt physical things, but it was still this unresolved thing in my head that I wanted to talk about and that, you know, that I believed was really, really important. So I set about starting to make it in a company called Calling the Shots, uh, ended up uh, commissioning uh, the project along with the BBC. And um, we set about, uh, yeah, starting to make uh, Stone with a Musical. And, you know, it was a lot of things that I never would have dreamed were possible were made. And because of this lack of connectivity, I think things became so much more practical. So all the band um, recorded from their own homes and sent all the tracks to us, uh, to us and we put them together. Um, we got hold of West End actors that we never would have got hold of if we weren't in coronavirus. And things began to, um, you know, snowball in terms of us, you know, achieving things that we really wouldn't have thought. And one actor in particular, uh, who's Louis Mescal, agreed to do the show. And I went down to London to record uh, Louis and we recorded his part and I was really, really excited. We, uh, I drove back home, uh, I had done nine hours of driving that day. I drove back home and I began to feel a little unwell. I remember I didn't have any dinner. And I went up to uh, my room and tried to go to bed. And about three o'clock I woke up and something clearly wasn't right at all. And an ambulance was called uh, less than 24 hours after my dreams of making a show uh, were finally coming true and I ended up in hospital and I did not get out of hospital for six weeks. While I was there um, they reinstalled a stoma, uh, a new one, and a lot of complications came from that. And something that struck me as well is that another layer of connectivity was sort of taken away. We sort of had coronavirus cause us all to become a little less uh, physically connected which essentially allowed the show to happen. But then being in hospital sort of took it that step further. You know, I had very, very limited access to visitors uh, in hospital and I was in hospital during one of the lockdowns. Uh, so we had very, very limited access to visitors. Uh, a family member was allowed to see me for less than an hour a day, but only because I was a long-term patient. Um, and the actual making of the show went from being Zoom to actually making uh, making decisions over WhatsApp because I wasn't able to make uh, Zoom calls, so I was able to hear things um, that you know um, the music supervisor would send me, make decisions and over WhatsApp and text them back and hope that the uh, yeah that the decisions would then be implemented. And actually, one of the recording sessions I wasn't able to attend at all. And very lucky for me, uh, Tom Brennan from Wardrobe Theatre stepped in. To, uh, to direct that particular session in my absence. But I think there's something that's always struck me, and it's about this whole thing, is that there is a uniqueness about this for everyone. It, this is a once-in-a-lifetime moment where we've experienced this thing, but it's not necessarily like that for everyone. And actually, people with disabilities, it sort of isn't unique. And it is something that sometimes we experience all the time. And that barrier to making art accessible is there all the time. And I think we as an industry have to choose whether or not we are going to go back to the status quo or whether or not we're going to make real changes for artists with disabilities to be able to continue to make art. 
And I think that is a choice that um, we need to take seriously. I fear we won't. But we have had this opportunity to take stock, think about how we do our creative practice, think about live work and how, uh, what changes can we make to certain types of live work to make it more accessible. You know, these things have been trickling in, relaxed shows are fantastic, you know, shows where it really doesn't matter if you leave or you come back, where we're not too bothered about that, those are good things. But ultimately, we need to think about long-term systematic practice as well. You know, how we make shows, how we make all types of art, you know, be it film, radio, or live theatre, or music, um, and how we incorporate sort of the, our, um, our practice in a way that really allows people with disabilities to be part of the arts process, or are we going to make the choice simply to go back to how it's always been? And that's always the temptation, particularly for, you know, the top level uh, director, producer, artistic um, director, who's always who's thrived before and all they want is to go back they've had you know they've done the they've, they've sung imagine and now they want to go back to how things how things were and I suppose one of the things I would say is we made something under the most intense of and the most sort of difficult circumstances where you know the lead artist was in a hospital um, unable to make phone calls um, and we still did it, and I'm really, really proud of that, and I do think that it's a really, really good piece of work, and I'd like to play some of it for you now. Joe Dempson, 28. Gay man. I do graphic design. I like to hike. I have a dog. Her name is Stacy. She says hi. I. I also have a stoma. His name is Colin. He says hi also. If you don't mind weird noises and sometimes odd smells and midnight bathroom trips, then date me. Please. Oh my god, I cannot sound this. Desperate. Okay, Colin, we can do this. It's been a year or so since Colin's been here with me. I thought I'd give dating a go. Sounds stupid, but that's me. And please don't say, oh, that's just gross. And don't say, you crap in a bag. Yeah. Yeah, this bag will be for life Why not make the guy it's attached to You'll find there's so much more to me Than the guy who's always changing his bed They say that love's even better with three Not just one guy, date a man and a stoner instead Right, Colin, let's give this a go He's hot Swipe right. Oh, his dog is so cute. Swipe right. Whoa, that is just a picture of his dog. Swipe left. I've run out of profiles. And two days later, I've got no matches. I feel awful, Colin, but um, it's not me. It's you. I think I need a stoma-free profile. No, 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 don't give me that look. I'll tell them all about you. I just don't think it's first date material, okay? It's not me, it's you I don't make the rules, okay You can't come too You've made them all run away I have to hide you You're in my way You can't have any flaws And be gay I'll tell them all about you, mate, okay? But not today New profile. Joe Dempson likes to hike, has a dog. I'm still gay. And I've got nothing else to say. 
and just like magic, I get a match. He looks cute, friendly, and after a day or two of chatting, he wants to go for a date. Well, cause I think, so I think for me, the show is the coming together of uh, a lot of aspects of my life that I've wanted to talk about for a while. So there is, uh, you know, there's a disability component, there's uh, an LGBT component, it talks about dating and it talks about life and how all these things can come together and how difficult they can be. But it also talks about acceptance and as much as, you know, I wanted to make a show that sheds a little bit of light on what um, my life is like it, and what lives, the lives of people who are like me uh, are like, I wanted to also make a show uh, that kind of shows what people can do about it and how we'd like to be treated and um, obviously this is very focused on the dating side of things but the lessons and the morals are universal in that um, you know what we need is you know is understanding and space and um, you know that is something that I hope in this clip that's coming up uh, that you'll be able uh, that you'll be able to see an example of uh, what that sort of that could be like pass me by Joe Joe are you in there Can I talk to you? I don't know what to say. I wish I knew just what to tell you. It's fine if you can't stay. You don't have to hide. You can show me who you are. I came here to date you. That means all of you, you don't have to hide what you're going through. You don't have to be ashamed, you should know I just think your brain, your brain. There's some things you can't know. There's some things that I can show you. I don't know what's in store But finishing this date Is just the first thing that I'd like to do Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine Thank you you for not freaking out. I just want you to know I feel you're safe. safe. I'm safe. So where can we go from here? I think one of the big things that I would say uh, as an industry is not to forget the tools that we have, um, that we've gathered over this period of, um, you know, of connectivity and creativity over the internet. Let's not forget how we can use tools, uh, online tools, to um, bring creatives together. Um, and that doesn't necessarily uh, exclusively uh, mean for people with disabilities, although of course it does. But actually, as a creative, now we know that if there's a cellist in Wales, then they can record there and send it to us and it will still be of a fantastic quality. I think, but then I think particularly for people with disabilities, it's when you're doing a project, whatever that may be, and having someone with a kind of disability that, like ME or, or, um, or having a stoma or anything like that, and that makes it difficult, it makes you think, oh, maybe actually this would be too difficult for them. Actually think about where they do fit in 
Uh, is it online tools, things like uh, things like Zoom, things like productivity packages online that's going to really help? Is it um, you know having more of those kind of people in the creative side rather than the production side? Or if they are in the production side, how uh, breaks, how um, how we can have uh, people shadowing roles, all sorts of things to allow uh, these people to really shine because. Um, I assure you that people like me do have uh, a lot of um, a lot to give the industry, and I think um, just making small changes with what we've learned over this period um, going forward will make not only how we as a community treat each other better, but it'll actually make the art better. And I really, really strongly believe that. I think we can create fantastic things, and just being open, being um, sort of being warm, being welcoming, and also having that time and having that patience, just like in the clip uh, that you just heard, um, is so crucial, um, both socially but also professionally as well. So I hope that this talk um, has given you some kind of insight into what being an artist with this kind of condition is like, but also hopefully how um, you as maybe you're an artist, maybe you're in production, or maybe you're an artistic director, or any of that kind of thing, how you can incorporate people like me into your practice, and how ultimately uh, the practical things you can do to make, uh, to make that work, and to ultimately, hopefully, uh, improve your workflow. So thank you so much for listening, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it.